Recording. Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome again to this uh, FRCS teaching uh, webinar. Um, topic tonight is uh, about muscle structure and physiology. I hope you can all hear me well. The present presentation done tonight by Sahib Memon, who is a senior registrar from Wales. He has recently passed the exam in November, so he has lots of a wealth of knowledge that he could embark on us and um, his recent knowledge and recent experience with the exam, which is, as you know, all is extremely valuable. Uh, Sahib has also been, like all of you, a member of this group, and um, he's, he's done a lot of practice, attended a lot of these uh, teaching sessions. Um, I'll be moderating the session. I'm Firas Arnaud. Um, other faculty members attending, we have Abdullah Hanoun, who's also um, one of the mentors here, and he'll be supporting us. Just housekeeping points. Uh, again, please, guys, if any questions, put it on the chat uh, uh, box or raise your hand symbol. Um, we will keep questions to the, we will keep questions coming and we'll get you, we'll get them answered by the mentors. And after the session, there will be a couple of Viva uh, practice questions. So if anyone is interested, please um, uh, let me know as soon as you can. So it's first uh, come first served basis. Anyone who attends will be eligible for a CPD certificate, so please let me know if anyone needs one. And um, again, this will, the video will be uh, edited and uh, published on YouTube channel, along with the previous teaching sessions, a channel called uh, uh, Postgraduate Orthopedic Fellowship um, course. Um, so now, uh, welcome everyone again, and uh, I'll uh, leave you with Sahib to welcome Sahib, and please go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Can you all hear me, I'm sure? Yes, Perhaps we can hear you. We can hear you, yeah. So let me uh, start with a slightly um, intro about uh, the topic. Uh, this is um, skeletal muscle and the nerve are the two most important topics in the basic sciences. As you all probably know, the basic science is a significantly dry topic in general. It does require a lot of dedications to remember and to go through the topics in clear detail so that when you are able to present, it provides you really solid marks. It is not much to go further in this uh, topic um, and, and you probably would be able to cover it easily. What the so the reason I've actually put a few things in there, uh, which are slightly over the uh, seven and eight mark. Most of people might uh, agree, might not agree that at some point in Viva, they will be asked questions which are probably um, beyond the level. But when you come to the, actually the basic sciences, uh, you, this is the one table you can square it very easily if you know the facts very well. From the point of view, um, as uh, this topic, uh, as you know, skeletal muscle, I will try to actually um, put a lot of uh, physiology in it because this uh, is mainly based on the physiological uh, concepts. I'll try to actually go very slow because since the topic is quite dry and actually a lot of material is there, I, I would rather go into a more of a conceptual basis of, this, uh, of the topic in more uh, detail and I will go slowly. If any point, please actually the men, uh, our mentors are around, they will be able to answer your questions. We will keep the questions till for the end. And uh, first of all, what exactly the skeletal muscle is? What is actually its structure? What is this basic unit, which is called sarcomere? What are the filaments involved in this? How does the synapse actually uh, works? What is actually an action potential, a brief description of that, which is a very important concept to conquer. <clears throat> muscle injury and then types of the muscle contraction, I'll go very briefly into them. So this is actually the, what we are covering today. I will slow nice and easy. At any given point, actually you feel like I'm going too fast, just let the um, initiator know and then we take it from there. 
So skeletal muscle is a specialized connective tissue. It provides contractile elements to support and facilitate human locomotion. It provides homeostatic storage for the electrolyte, glucose, amino acids, and fatty acid. Hence, it's an instant source of energy when the body requires it to do any activity. It protects the internal organ, obviously we know that. Types of the fibers are usually, there is a classification they're very, very fondly asked by the examiners, is type one and type two, which is red and white fibers. The red fibers are actually are called slow oxidative fibers or red ox they are called because they're red um, and have got oxidative component to it. And the type two fibers are the fa fast fibers, which are actually the white fibers, which has got less of a oxidative stuff, i.e. Uh, mitochondrial, because the mitochondria is of a powerhouse of the cell. It has got a higher, uh, is a, a very low quantity of that because the instant energy source of energy is the available glycogen or glucose at the time when they utilize it. The main filaments involved are actin and myosin, as you would know, and these are actually the smallest component of that. This, these filaments make them a, a basic working unit of the skeletal muscle, which is um, called sarcomere. The, this is a detailed diagram of the actually actin and myosin. On your left is actin, which has got the chains which are intermingled or on the in the helix space and there are main three components of the actin is uh, f actin tropomyosin and troponin complex however the myosin filament is a heavy chain composed of the two heavy chains and the two light chains you can see this structure and this uh, slide presentation will be available for for you on our in, um, youtube channel you can see that these two heavy chains is making a helix, which is actually going up to the end, and they are connecting with the light chain, which will be involved in the contractile um, activity, which I will be showing it next. So this is a sarcomere. This is electron micrographic picture of the muscle. You can see these are the bands on the um, on this level. Uh, at the level of uh, electron microscopy, you can see there are uh, two types of one are dark band, one are light bands, and in which there are actually the there is uh, the lines which we will be describing it further in details. The A bands or N isotropic band means it is a darker band, is uh, the component which actually is, is uh, sitting down as a black band. The I band is a lighted band or isotropic band. The H band is a heavy chain band, which is sitting in the center. And the Z line is useric line, which is actually is holding the actin filaments, which goes toward the I band. The M line is a myosin line, which is a main central component of the myosin band. If Thank you, can you uh, can I Can I uh, just say, this is very, very interesting, actually. Um, I don't know if, if we want to repeat it for people to take a note of, because if you know what the, all the M and A and um, M and A and H bands, what they are mean, what they mean, it's a lot easier to remember, isn't it? Yeah. So Rather the, than just remembering random letters, you put yeah. meaning to those letters, which I think um, not many people will know. Yeah. So the darker band is N isotropic band. So it is actually taking the light, which is cannot pass through the uh, it completely. So it's a darker band is A band. The lighter band is isotropic band. And the H band is a heavy chain band, which you can see in this, uh, uh, in the area, which is more hardened on the sides. Then the Z line is useric line. Don't ask me the spelling for that because it's a, it's a German word. So that's actually the main line which actually connect the actin filaments to each, uh, in the center. Uh, the Z line is a, comp is a main protein which goes down all the way and the actin filaments are connected to it. The M band is a myosin line or myosin band which actually goes down to the center of the, where the heavy chain is actually connected to each other in the three-dimensional structure. Brilliant, so, thank you. So you can see that this sarcomere is in slightly more detail. This picture 
in the center is the most important picture um, for this topic. If you can't take away anything but anything, this picture, I'm sure you can see my mouse going around it. Um, it's actually the sarcomere. This is you all you have to make a diagram of. You need to know it by heart. So this is sarcomere, which is between the two Z lines. This is a structural unit of the skeletal muscle where the contractile elements work. So this is the um, so this is the Z line, and these are the actin filaments, which are thin filaments, which goes down from the sides. Okay. Then there is a myosin band, myosin um, filament, which is sitting down the center, on which the actin filaments come in to uh, between in, intervene between each other. Now this is two dimensional structure, but th there is pictures available for the three dimensional structures. Now, this, this, this is the central line, which is the M line, which connect the myosin line as we saw it in the electron micrographic picture. The actin filament, you can see now this A band, which is N isotropic band is actually the myosin molecule or my, myosin uh, filaments overlapping the actin uh, filaments. This area is called A band which is an isotopic or darker band because these myosin are the very heavy chain molecules. The N isotropic band is start from the hair, goes down to the next up to the second uh, myosin line, which you can see um, in, the, in the later pictures. You can see these in a slightly more detail that you have got actin filaments coming down on the sides and then these are heavy myosin chain with their multi, uh, multiple heads around that area. Okay, this is con a difference between the relaxed muscle and the contracted muscle. That's how you see it in a schematic diagram, how actin actually overlap on the myosin. You can see the Z, li Z lines are far apart and here they are come together to be become a contracted muscle. The most important film, uh, uh, thing which we, we think actually is um, myosin band, but actually actin is much more important component of this. It has got the three main areas, filament actin or F actin, tropomyosin, and the troponin complex, which can print contains of C, I, and T um, um, binding sites. In greater detail, you can see there is a actin filament down here. You can see there is a site on the actin, F actin or filament actin, which is covered by the troponin complex. The tropomyosin is a sheet of filaments which goes on the, on the area of the myosin binding site. These are the target sites. These are target sites around that area where they are covered by the troponin complexes. To make it slightly story, start with the kind of uh, how the contraction happened, you get, got to get the calcium to come and come connect with the C component of the troponin complex. It induces the conformational change. The T component actually drag the tropo, uh, tropomyosin away from the target site and allow the uh, myosin head to come on the target side to be attached. Coming to the synapse. Now this is another concept which is very favorite concept for the uh, thing. In my basic sciences viva, this whole topic is which you discuss in significant detail. Though it was five minutes, but it was very, very chop, 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 chop business. So you need to know this very well. And you should be able to make a schematic simplest possible diagram for the for this area this is very complex it is tutorial you have to make it very very super simple diagram now synapse is the area where the nerve ending comes in contact with the skeletal muscle or any target organ you can see here in the first picture there is exon which is coming down with his nerve endings and landing up down onto the surface of the muscle. And the muscle cell has got its own nuclei, has got the pits available down that area where the nerve ending is actually coming in contact. 
These are telogliar cells, which are cells which are connective tissue cells to support this area in terms of connective tissue. You can see the myelin sheath on the top. This is uh, obviously, you can see there's a lot of synapses connecting to the lot of skeletal muscle to provide uh, a, a neural ending to a target organ, hence the skeletal muscle. This is the area where you can see there's a disc nerve endings coming down actually uh, on the surface of the skeletal muscle. Um, I've got a terminal and you can see a lot of mitochondria are rumbling around to actually make this actually an, quite an active muscle. Especially the fine muscles of the hand have got a lot of nerve endings available for four months. So there are smaller muscle unit in a finer muscle uh, activities. These are the synaptic vesicles and this is the, actually the pit. I will go into slightly more detail into this because this is important uh, for a um, for few for you, um, in, in few questions, actually, this is very, very important to understand this. So what happens here is that you have got this muscle nerve ending. You have got actually this muscle, sorry, the nerve endings and got a muscle membrane around that area. You can see that these vesicles comes and attach to the surface, release the acetylcholine in the pits available to down there. There is a subneural cleft where they go and attach down that area. There is a um, there are a few actually other structures, but I will try to actually make it as simple as possible. So this is an um, area where you have got acetylcholine, acetylcholine East phase, which, which basically is responsible to, just remember the acetylcholine East phase because we will talk about it in a little later. The acetylcholine release in the synaptic vesicles, they release in the, in the pit, where it actually comes down and attached to the, these acetylcholine receptors. These are the chemically activated uh, chemical activated um, channels which increase the sodium permeability in the membrane and hence activate voltage gated sodium channels later on to activate further now this is a slight concept it is a quite a heavy picture but it is very simple concept that what do you mean by the all this action potential business this is very important concept. It has to be known by every, uh, everyone because this is actually the basis of the nerve conduction and the muscular activity. Here you can see that actually what are the levels inside and outside we have got available on the surface on the, in the cell. So the sodium is 142 milliequivalent per liter on the outer side and about 14 milliequivalent inside. The potassium is four equivalent on the outside. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, so 140 of the, yeah, 142, and then the four, 14 should be inside. And potassium is four equivalent on the outside and 140 equivalent per liter on the inside. This is to maintain the resting membrane potential across the cell membrane. So you have got a high um, uh, concentration of the sodium outside the cell and uh, low concentration of the potassium outside the cell and conversely inside the cell. Now you always have in every single cell a leaky channels which keep actually letting the sodium come out so they can diffuse in and out all the time. However, there are sodium and potassium ATPase pumps available which keep that resting membrane potential to the level so it does not get excited. In simplest term, that the body or the cell has to be stay in the resting membrane potential or the voltage where it cannot get activated unnecessarily. This is maintained by the most important function is sodium, potassium, ATPase pump. Now on the right side of the image, you can see there are, uh, these are the channels on the surface membranes. The sodium is basically trying to get in, but the activation gate is closed. When there's a, this, these are the voltage gated channels. They're not the chemically activated channels. They are voltage gated channels. These are two types of the channels. Sodium voltage gated channels and sodium chemical um, activated channels. And here, once the, there is a, uh, the sodium uh, permeability due to the leaky channels arrived at level, which cannot be maintained, or the, or the voltage across the membrane can change, these are get activated and the sodium channels open up and then the sodium rushes in very quickly, as quickly as possible. The moment they get enough sodium inside, the inner side gate closes and the sodium channels stop happening. 
to translate it and same happen in the potassium way. To translate that into the actual potential, we have got a normally a minus 90 millivolt resting membrane potential. Your leaky channel slightly get up, but is constantly maintained at the level of the resting membrane potential by the sodium potassium ATPase pump until you come to the stage when you have either acetylcholine comes in and a chemical gated sodium channel activated, the sodium started to rush in. And because it's um, across the membrane, there is a polarity. On one side, it's significantly positive. On the other side, it's significantly negative. Now, this polarity start dropping. So it's depolarizing. So it's depolarizing. The polarization is starting to finish and it's getting the voltage to be equivalent on the zero. However, if there's a time um, uh, fragment, uh, time component into that until it actually uh, get to the, um, the, all the channels get closed down. As you can see, the second gate of the sodium channel closes. That lead to the potential of much more positive and hence the inner gate of the sodium channel closes down. Then the, because the potassium gate channels are activated at the level of the zero, they started to kind of actually start to become leaky. When they become leaky, they rushes out. Hence, the, they start regaining the polarity back in the system. And they bring it down right to the level of the uh, near the resting on potential. Now, at this level, we have got the biggest problem available to the cell that the whole polarity is completely reversed. Now, there is a function of the sodium and potassium ATPase pump to regain that polarity back in position, hence, what the sodium potassium pump does is bring throw the three sodium out and bring the two potassium in with every stroke of ATPase. I repeat, it bring the three sodium, uh, it throw the three sodium out and bring the two potassium in, not only restoring the chemical gradient, but also getting the polarity back into onto the track. Now, this is the diagram which you have to make it on the in the in the viva. So you start as a minus 70 because it's a skeletal muscle in the nerve, it is minus 90. It goes up to the 55 is a threshold potential from where all the voltage gated sodium channels open. They continue up to that level and you can see the down here, the membrane permeability of the sodium and potassium channels. At what level they activate. Okay. And hence you, as I described, it happened. Another important concept in this is what is the absolute and uh, what is the relative refractory period. The definition of the refractory period is that the nerve fiber or the muscle cannot be reactivated during that phase. So there is absolutely no possibility of the membrane cell can be reactivated again, i.e. opening the voltage gated sodium channels until it regains its normal resting membrane potential. That's an absolutely refractory period. The period between the, that potential uh, action potential and the another coming on action potential is between that period is a relative a relative refractive period where the sodium potassium ATPS pump is trying to regain the polarity back into the system. Here, there's a very much possibility if the another impulse comes in, it can get activated. Now, once this action potential is arrived on the surface membrane, what actually happens? So this actually is like a roller coaster, which you start walking around on the surface of the membrane. Unless you've got a myelin sheet, you would find the next available space on the surface membrane to jump. This is called saltatory um, conduction or the action of the action potential. Here I have to say that this, these are the kind of, this is the muscle fibers you can see or the sarcolemma or the, uh, or the muscle membrane. And then you have got a T tubule which goes right inside there. It's a big imagination of the surface membrane. You can see that there is actually is a sarcoplasm reticulum which is col collecting the calcium inside down there. It has got a calcium pumps inside. Now what happens when the sodium has get accumulated, the calcium channels are very slow gated channels. They start bringing the calcium in the in the cytoplasm or the, sarc or the sarcoplasm of the muscle. You can see the actin and myosin filament are onto the each other. And if you come down to it area, it, uh, and you can see that on the surface membrane of the sarcoplasm reticulum, how the calcium release is basically when the calcium get inside the membrane, 
it attaches on the surface of the protein called this is slightly complex concept now this is for the seven and eights so the calcium comes in is actually attached to the calcium protein and then it actually releases down there this also is the system the same system occurs in the vesicles as well synaptic vesicles as well so this area is very important in the concept of how does the botulinum toxin work so in the synapse because the calcium comes inside attached to the calcicutin protein and that bring the vesicle on the surface of it if you provide a botulinum toxin around that area it deactivate with the system called synaptobrevin protein complex which stop the vesicle to allow it to attach to the surface of that or allow it to release the vesicle into the system and into the synaptic cleft the same system actually works within the uh, sarcoplasm reticulum as well now this is actually is a, is a how the botulinum toxin work this is a synaptobrevin con concept guys this is this is a very complex area but i'm just making it simple for it that this is the synaptobrevin protein complex which attaches to the synaptic vesicle and does not allow acetylcholine to release acetylcholine in the system hence the acetylcholine cannot be released and it it get blocked completely coming to the walk along theory or the so or the um, contraction theory where you have got you can see down here there's the the and the actin filaments which i've actually described earlier on the affectin or filament actin they comes down here and actually make these uh, this is the actin component and this is a myosin chain now these are the light chain of the myosin which actually make the myosin head and you remember i was talking about this calcium coming in attaching to the troponin c making it a conformational change drag out the tropomyosin away from the binding site myosin head comes in contact attached to down that area and it walk along uh, along the membrane this is actually slightly in more detail why uh, what exactly happens so the basically the it the actin actually filaments is comes down here it can attach down to the with the atp is pump down area so the the atp actually is coming attached down area myosin had contact the atp converting to adp and of and the phosphate molecule and then only the contraction happen the most important concept here is that until the atp is not available this myosin head will not come off so if you have the atp block it anywhere this will not detach from the myosin binding site hence you maintain the tone without using any energy at all so this is the best conservation of energy mechanism in a in a god has provided us so if our muscle are contracted we maintain our tone of our muscle by making the uh, myosin head attached to it unless the atp is not available and this is ready to be decomposed or dehydrolyzed into atp and five bond it will not let the myosin to go away to the next uh, next site so that's how you maintain your tone so anyway atp binds the myosin head detaches there is a resting uh, resting component it comes actually down to the atp and uh, comes into the next available uh, uh, myosin binding site that becomes available the bus um, the light chains going attached to the uh, myosin uh, binding site and the atp cannot in atp and pi this um, um, myosin attaches to it and then the myosin head pivots and bends and allowing the atp to pi component again the process start and constantly then hence the whole walking along theory happen and this is the issue the way how it happens myosin filament actin surface active binding site myosin head it comes and attach it hinges on atps system and it is walk along with every power stroke every time now to describe this in the exam i just made this um, little chart a flow chart where you can actually talk about in greater detail while if you remember this chart it tells you exactly what happens so that's all you need to remember for the um, for to to talk about the walk along theory and this is another kind of similar kind of a um a corresponding diagrams accordingly so that you can make your concepts slightly more clearer now this is actually some now the coming to the clinical applications of these concepts the one of the concept is what is tetany 
A tectony is actually when you have got the hypocalcemia. So a lot of actually, uh, I was asked in exam uh, at uh, some point when we have told, well, how come the um, tectony happens? Why hypocalcemia make our muscles to go into a constant contractile stage? And that's why you actually got into the resistor contractions. What actually happens in this picture, if you look at the sodium channels, they are negatively charged sodium channels. It has got a calcium, uh, because they are negatively charged, a lot of them are lined by the calcium channels, the calcium uh, molecules. Because these are lined by the calcium molecules, the space between them is very, very narrow to allow to sodium come in. That's the normal state of the calcium. When the calcium goes down, this calcium is get mobilized out of these channel linings, making the hole much more leakier than normal, leading to the constant contractile stage constantly happening because calcium molecule is not making the channels narrow enough to close completely. So they constantly, the voltage gated sodium channels become a leaky channels and allow the contractile stage to constantly happen. That leads to the constant contraction of the muscle and leads to the tetany and hence the hyper um, stimulatable or uh, hyper stimulant channels is available. That's why you've got a chivostic sign which you tap the facial nerve and it contracts and all that sort of signs for the hypocalcemia. Then comes to another uh, important concept, refractory period, which we talked about. Myasthenia gravis is a condition where it's, where it's got antibodies against um, the escalcholine esterase. The escalcholine esterase is the enzyme which sits down the synaptic cleft here, where the escalcholine is released in the system, in the, in the cleft. This is responsible to leave the acetyl and choline and get picked up back into the vesicle system. And that will, so you can see that process happening down that this area. So the constantly calcium is released uh, and the acetylcholine comes out in the system and this, this gets picked up by the acetylcholine east phase and is divided to acetyl and choline. This is actually being blocked by the antibodies which are uh, working against the acetylcholine east phase and hence the disease called myosin and gravis. The people who are actually known about Bollywood, um, Amitabh Bachchan has the um, myosin and gravis which is always on treatment for anticholis east phase enzymes for it. Botulinum toxin we talk about that it does not allow the vesicles to come out. The other important concept is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. How does the dystrophin protein is actually deficiency make the patients to go into Duchenne muscular dystrophy? Our skeletal muscles are connected by our F actins, which are in the skeletal muscle. If you can see this picture, the F actin is connected to the dystrophin protein which this complex, which is called dystrophin uh, sarcoglycan complex. This is the glycocalyx connected with the dystrophin. So glycocalyx is actually is a Y-shaped uh, glycoprotein, which, which works like a, um, like a post on the cell membrane. This get connected with a dystrophin protein and that get connected with the F-actin, which is a filament actin, which is a part of the skeletal muscle. When this connection is destroyed, the dystrophin is destroyed, there is no ability of the skeletal muscles to anchor upon the sarcolemal membrane. And hence the muscle activity happen within the muscle. They cannot make the whole skeletal muscle at contract as one unit. This leads to the, death, this leads to the uh, significant amount of the um, uh, mus muscular insufficiency and hence the Patients are actually die at the age of uh, 20 to 25 because there is uh, they start losing their respiratory muscle uh, slowly and gradually because of the abnormality and mutation of the dystrophin protein which is here. So glycocalyx, dystrophin, effectin. These are three things you have to remember. This complex is destroyed because the dystrophin connection is not there. Muscle injury. This is the simplest you can actually tell your examiner how does a muscle get injured and repaired. So the physical trauma happened, inflammatory mediators comes in exactly like a bone, damaged cellular components, inflammatory cascade. I'm just giving you a simple terms to talk about them. 
produces the proteolytic enzyme and reactive oxygen intermediates, leading to the ATP-dependent failing failure of the mechanism, raised intracellular calcium concentration. This is different in the muscle. So this ATP system, which normally maintain the resting membrane potential down in the cell membrane nerve, there is actually making the intra, uh, accumulation of the calcium within the system. This calcium activates the enzyme like proteases, phospholipases, and in turn damage the muscle structure from within. This leads to the macrophage to infiltrate, phagocytic damage protein, muscle fibers, eventually leading to the scar deposition. Since the muscles do not regenerate, only a limited amount of the regeneration happen in the proliferation of the residual myoblasts, which are very, very rare in occurrence. Coming down to the how can we detect the muscle injury and what are the muscle components, we do the um, EMGs or electromyography. In electromyography, you put the needle in the, around the nerve endings or in the muscle and you will get this potential. This is because of the nerve area. So in a normal muscle, you get this motor unit action potential. When you have got a denervated nerve, you basically have got this, what we call is simple fibrillations. In the re innervated muscle, you, slide, you get actually a complexes which comes actually in this position, in this sort of a configuration. What actually happened is in denervation, the spontaneous activity due to the increased sensitivity of the estrel choline lead to the sharp waves and hence in the chronically it becomes fasciculation which are uncontrolled because now the muscle itself is actually becomes a center it's leaking the sodium out getting it activated by himself like a, when the when a heart actually is uh, when there's a uh, heart block is there the con the cardiac muscles automatically stimulate itself and try to contract these are the fasciculation in the skeletal muscle when this denervation happens because there's too much acetylcholine is available, there's no nerve endings coming up from there, it is not connected. In the acute denervation, there's a sharp face because all the acetylcholine available is, comes in one go and it gets activated. The chronic denervation is fasciculation, which is actually when the, all the nerve endings are there. now the muscle become its own stimulant or the epitome of the um, whole havoc. And they're constantly contracting and try to become coordinated one. When this muscle gets re innervated, there's a, initially there is a reduced amplitude of motor action potential. Hence, you have got a larger, longer duration of the motor unit action potential. But because there's a poor recruitment of the muscle component, it, the amplitude remains low. But in the later component, the larger amplitude comes in because now it is more stable, consistent firing of the action potential and hence you get the good recruitment of the unit, which gives the polyphasic signals. In the early re innervation is a monophasic signals. In the late, more stable amplitude, motor action, unit action potential, you have got a polyphasic signals, which tells you where the nerve is injured. Uh, more or less, the basic sciences section should be like that. We should be teaching uh, the examiner. Um, on the basic sciences section. I think that you covered that really, really well. Um, it's, um, I like how you, you also, because in the exam nowadays, they have to put a clinical component, even in the this, in this basic sciences section. So um, I like how you, uh, you know, showed us the clinical implication of, of muscle physiology in a condition like tetany and may my senior gravis and photolinum toxin injection and how they all work. Um, I just I have nothing to add, nothing to add, but just want to say if 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 someone finds this, this difficult, like me, uh, because it's very very hard topic to and and, and obviously Sahib has uh, you know approached this very well. But generally, stick to the principles. Highlight the buzzwords because sometimes what can happen is as we talk and we know what we're talking about, the examiners might switch off a little bit. So the buzzwords, say them loudly, repeat them. Buzzwords like sarcomere, basic contractile unit is the sarcomere. Um, um, talk about the action potential, you know, highlight these words. 
the motor units. Uh, make sure that you put, you let the examiner um, know about the resting potential, um, that there is resting potential and that there is a threshold and there is the gated channel and the gated channel opened by acetylcholine. Make sure these buzzwords are clearly transferred to the examiner, yeah? This will get you out of jail in these questions, the buzzwords, um, and will sort of pass you. And then you can also use all this rest of this information to get higher marks. Uh, will will pay off. So thank you very much, Sahib. This is a very difficult topic you, you discussed, and you explained it very nicely to us. And um, we haven't covered in any previous teaching. Um, it, 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 a lot of us will might find it difficult because um, this, we don't discuss this very much in meetings or in coffee rooms or trauma meetings. So it, um, it is a dry topic, but you managed to make it very interesting. So thank you very much, Sahib, for for uh, potential, the sarcomere. Um, and I, I, I just want to, to hide, uh, just remember another thing is, is unfortunately, this doesn't cover everything about the muscles. Um, we still have the tendons, obviously, um, the type insertions of tendons. We have the topics of muscle contraction and things. So it, 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 it's a, possibly another hour to cover the whole. Um, yeah. They, the they, whole, they the ask physiology muscle. about it, the different types of muscle contracture, mm -hmm. eccentric, yeah. eccentric, um, and then the open chain, closed chain, and all of that. So they can start from talking about basic science, and then they move to physiology, and then they move to physiotherapy, and then they, move, they can do that. And, and they do that. And they do that. I mean, yeah. my question was about different exercises and types of exercises and open chain, closed chain and all of that. So they can start from one end and, and you know, move to the other. And also, uh, yeah, the muscle uh, metabolic systems and things like this, which Saeb has touched on also. But uh, thank you, Saeb. Uh, so th thank you everyone uh, again for attending. Um, this will be the end of the presentation. Um, next is the Viva session. So um, we had the pleasure of having 59 of you registered today for the, for the teaching. So thank you, everyone. Uh, please get in touch with me if anyone's a certificate. So we'll end the teaching now. And the next will be 